Um, so I'm Sarah Lester. I'm the research and program manager of the Sustainable Fisheries Group at UC Santa Barbara, and just want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, we're really excited to share our research, um, discuss the presentations that we posted online, and have a discussion with those of you that are um, sort of involved or interested in the West Coast ground fish fishery. So the goals that we had when um, sort of putting together the event today and and posting our research um, as those videos online, where we wanted to, we want an opportunity to share our research with stakeholders involved in the fishery. Um, we also wanted to have an, um, an event that was um, interactive, so it's not just about us presenting our research, but we're really interested in hearing feedback on our work and on your experiences um, in this fishery, and our hope is that will then inform some of our future research on this topic. So just as a housekeeping matter, we're going to ask that all participants, whether you're joining by phone or computer, mute yourself unless you're asking a question or making a comment. Um, and how we're going to run the event today is we're going to start off by giving a bit of a big picture overview of the research. Um, and then following that, we're going to have each one of the presenters that posted a video online give just a one minute overview of their research. So just a brief summary of that presentation. Um, and then after each one of those one minute summaries, we'll open it up for questions or comments. Um, and then after all of those, we'll have some time for just more general discussion about the research as a whole or, or your experiences in the fishery, and then um, finish with a little bit more of a discussion. Um, if you want to ask a question on any of those uh, video overviews, um, it would be great if you can either say your name or type your name into the chat box, and then we'll call on people in order. Um, and we ask that you keep those comments and questions to about one to two minutes so that we can make sure to get through all of them. And then if you have like a much sort of bigger or longer comment, just save it to the, to the end of the um, evening. So I'm going to start by handing it over to Chris Costello, who's a professor of natural resource economics at the Bren School at UCSB. And he's the lead principal investigator on this project. And he's just going to start by giving a little bit of an overview. Chris? Great. Thanks, Sarah. And welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for your time. We know everybody's time is precious. And one of the reasons we chose this format is to sort of hope that we get the broadest participation possible. So we're really looking forward to the next couple of hours. And you know, we'll try to keep our comments to a minimum, because really, as Sarah said, we'd like to, to get feedback from you and get ideas from you. So let me make a couple of introductory comments, and then we'll get started. Um, this, the research we're about to discuss is, in a sense, the culmination of a Sea Grant funded project that is a collaboration between UC Santa Barbara, where we are sitting here, and researchers at the University of Washington. Uh, the videos have, that have been posted online include uh, several research projects resulting from this grant and some related research that isn't directly funded by the Sea Grant project, but is, is you know, directly related to the work um, that is by the Nature Conservancy. As I think most people on the call know, in January of 2011, the West Coast groundfish fishery transitioned to a multi-species ITQ, which is a form of a catch share um, in which fishermen own shares of total allowable catch of all target and, and most bycatch species in the fishery. The, one of the main purposes of this research project was to examine the, the impacts of this switch to ITQ. So looking you know, before the ITQ and after the ITQ, and looking at how the, the implementation of that new management approach changed fishing behavior and other socioeconomic factors. One of the reasons we chose this fishery to focus on, and I think one reason Sea Grant was interested in it, is that it provides really probably the best example anywhere in the world of the weak stock hurdle that faces many fisheries around the world. Um, species such as yellow eye and canary rockfish have historically been overfished, mostly because they grow so and reproduce so, so slowly. And so as a consequence, they have very low annual catch limits, which in principle could be exceeded in a single haul. And we know that that has caused a lot of trouble for the fishery in the past because it may limit the catch of target species uh, even though they're, you know, there's an abundance of them or it, potentially an abundance of them. So topics covered in this research project include an analysis of the weak stock challenge, 
um, including the formation of risk pools and the idea of gear switching, spatial and temporal fishing patterns and how they were affected by the ITQ and discarding. So, you know, we've, we feel that this project provides a unique opportunity not just to learn what changes um, arose from the transition to ITQs in this fishery, but also to evaluate the benefits to fishermen resulting from different kinds of cooperative mechanisms. And our hope is that the, the insights that we gain could be useful not just for this fishery, but for other fisheries. So the, as Sarah mentioned, what we'll do now is we'll uh, move to kind of the next phase of the presentation where each video that's been presented, that's been posted on the, on the website, um, will, so the author of each video will give a one minute overview of their research and then I think the idea is that after each of those one minute overviews, we'll open it up to, to any questions that might arise. And then once we've gotten through those, we'll move to the next one and so forth. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And we'll start with yours. Oh, and I guess you can see the, oh, I'm, I'm first. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm sure not everybody has seen the videos. We, we were asked to keep them to around 15 minutes. Um, mine is, is, happens to be the first one posted here, and what I'd like to do is just give a quick overview of that. My um, research project that I decided to highlight is a little bit unique in the collection you'll see because it, it uses a data set that's broader than, it includes the West Coast ground fish fishery, but it's much broader than that. It includes, in fact, fisheries from all over the world. And the purpose of this research project was to look both theoretically and empirically, that is theory using you know, economic theory and fisheries theory, and then empirically using data from fisheries around the world to ask the question whether the switch to ITQs or other forms of catch shares changes the way that fishery regulators manage fisheries. So that's the main research question. And the mechanism through which we think this might occur is that is through a change in incentives to the participating fishermen. And so the basic idea here is that when you switch from something like a limited entry system, which we've had in, in the United States, to an ITQ system where fishermen are given a guaranteed stake in the fishery over the long term, um, that potentially changes their incentives uh, to lobby the regulator or otherwise influence the regulator on fisheries catch. And there are lots of anecdotes around the world about this, but no one's really done a comprehensive analysis of it. So we started out by building a theory of this and showed that under certain conditions you would expect this to arise. But then I think the real contribution of the paper is more empirical. We collected a data set of fisheries all over the world that have stock assessments, and we looked at the, when those, some of those switch to ITQs and some of those don't. Um, about half switch and about half don't. And the ones that switch do it at different times. And that gave us enough sort of stratification or enough va uh, variability to be able to test empirically whether the fisheries are managed significantly differently when the, the ITQ is adopted. And we found empirically, consistent with the theory, we found that in fact they are. As soon as the ITQ is adopted, the fisheries tend to be managed uh, more conservatively and that that result is strongest when the fishery is in need of rebuilding. So if stocks are particularly low, the fishery manager lowers exploitation a lot more when they switch to ITQs than if they don't switch to ITQs. And so that, that was uh, the paper and it's co-authored with a guy named Corbett Granger at the University of Wisconsin. And I have a draft of the paper, which I'm willing to share with people. So you're welcome to send me an email if you'd like to see, see the whole paper. I'd be happy to answer any questions if, if there are any. Great. Thank you, Chris. So um, if anyone has a question or, or a comment on Chris's presentation, um, if you could just say your name or type it into the chat box. If we have multiple questions, I'll, I'll then call on people in order. Don't everybody go at once. And if not, we can move on. Did you have a question, Mary? Yeah, I was just going to ask you, because I took my um, 
don't know how many teachers were using your empirical data set, but I'm just wondering if they span the range of the kinds of fisheries, um, or, or were they all sort of unified in being kind of industrial scale? Or are all sort of you know demersal fisheries? Was there, was there really a range of different fisheries? Um, Mary, I'm sorry, but we're having a hard time hearing you. Uh, could you try to? Could you just repeat that a little bit louder? Yeah, I'm just wondering if in your empirical data set you had a range of kinds of fisheries, um, from sort of okay. more industrial scale to smaller scale, or different kinds of um, species. You know, demersal, pelagic, that sort of thing. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, and I'll just briefly <laughs> answer it. So. Uh, because we, we weren't just trying to look at how does fishery exploitation change, we were trying to look at the whole uh, control, fisheries scientists call the control rule, so how uh, fisheries exploitation depended on the biomass of the stock. And because of that, we needed to only look at fisheries that had stock assessments because we needed an estimate of the biomass. So we restricted attention to just fisheries with stock assessments. Incidentally, most, almost all ITQ fisheries in the world have stock assessments, so that wasn't too limiting. Um, so we looked, we used the RAM legacy database as, you know, the, the total population of fisheries we looked at. And like I said, about half of those switched sometime within the, the period of, of study and about half didn't. And that database, you know, it's, it is, it does emphasize sort of uh, larger scale um, developed world fisheries, but there are also several fisheries that you know that are small scale and span a, a range of life history traits and so forth. Okay. Any other questions? All right, we will move on to our next presentation. Um, this is Kate Labram from the Nature Conservancy. She's going to be talking about TNP's engagement in the ground fish fishery um, and results of their work with the California Risk Pool. Kate? Kate, are you on mute? We don't hear you. Now? Yes. yes. Great. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. So thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, I'm Kate Labram, Fisheries Project Director with the Nature Conservancy in California. I um, wanted to note that there's a couple other Nature Conservancy staff on the line here today. Um, and as Chris described earlier, TNC wasn't formally a part of the Sea Grant research, but we were invited to share some of our relevant experience and findings from our engagement in the ground fish fishery here on the West Coast. And so my presentation describes the background of how TNC originally came into working in the West Coast ground fish fishery, um, and then it continued into describing some of the collaborative fishing arrangements that we're working with right now, like the California Risk Pool and the Morro Bay Community Quota Fund. And both of these entities, uh, which we've come to term as co-management entities, um, are really working to maximize both economic and conservation opportunities in the fishery here. And so the, uh, the meat of the presentation was really in describing the results of operating the California Risk Pool over the past uh, three and a half years with um, fully fledged results from 2011 to 2013, showing some of the bycatch rates and target species capture rates of the risk pool compared to the wider fleet uh, in the West Coast ground fish fishery. And then um, moved into describing how the risk pool collects data out on the water using an electronic logbook application called eCatch. Um, and how that data is then used and taken out of eCatch to update spatial plans that the risk pool uses out on the water. Um, and I'm happy to describe further what a risk pool is if anyone on the line is unfamiliar. And then the final uh, portion of the presentation briefly touched on uh, TNC's initial divestiture of quota share that we own in this fishery to a newly formed nonprofit called the Morro Bay Community Quota Fund, uh, which now owns and leases that quota out of Morro Bay with uh, the goals of advancing 
both economic and environmental uh, outcomes in the fishery, including um, providing funds into an industry directed uh, collaborative fisheries research fund, as well as um, bringing in new participants, uh, new entrants into the fishery. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. I think that I have a question. Do you have any? Oh, I was going to say, any questions for Kate? I have a question. I don't know if you hear me. Ah, uh, yes, I can. Yep. Go ahead. If you have an, uh, a uh, limited entry fishing system on one species of fish and you have an individual quota uh, on that same species, you've got two different ways of managing it. And along comes a um, NGO, and politically, he gets that fishery with the individual quota system closed down. What happens to that quota that that fisherman holds? Does it go away? Does it just sit there dormant? That he can no longer use it because the, the, the fishery was closed down. So I think I caught most of that. There's a little bit of an echo on the line. So let me repeat back what I heard. So the can you hear me? We can hear you, Kate. Okay, great. So um, the the question I heard was if a if an NGO comes in and shuts down an individual fishing quota fishery, what happens to the quota that the fishermen own? Is that the the question that you're asking? I think it is. Whoever they are, I think they've got it like just on in the background and they type in they log in. Because every time I unmute it, that person's name gets like always up. So I'm I'm getting a bunch of echoes. I don't know if anyone else is hearing better. Perhaps that's on my end. I think we need to. So, okay, I'm just, one more time, I'm going to ask everyone that's not talking to mute themselves. Kate, I'm going to suggest that you answer the question you think you heard. Sorry, sir, what was that answer to the question? How? How? I'm going to suggest you answer the question you think you heard. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and answer that. So, um, you know, then uh, I just want to make a point that the Nature Conservancy's goal in coming into the West Coast ground fish fishery was never to shut anything down. In fact, uh, we put the assets that we owned uh, back to work in the fishery with uh, fishermen partners that were wanting to get out on the water and, and use those limited entry permits or use that quota. Um, but in the hypothetical scenario where an NGO would shut down a fishery, I think it would be a, a regulatory discussion where um, you know, that would be up to the council, whether it's a federally managed fishery or up to the state, if it's a state managed fishery, uh, as to how those assets would then be um, either recouped from the fishery or redistributed. Um, I think, you know, these are public trust uh, assets. They are not uh, true property rights when we're talking about quota. And so no one um, uh, actually owns these. We're given a privilege and a percentage of uh, the total allowable catch to go out and capture each year. I hope, I hope that gets at what you're asking, but um, might be more to elaborate on there. Thank you, Kate. I have also, Kate, if I could just 
also make a clarifying comment about that. Maybe I also misunderstood the question, but the, we've recently done an analysis of fisheries all over the world that have switched to these different forms of ITQs or, or related forms, and we've only been able to find of, of like five or six hundred different play, fisheries that have implemented these in different parts of the world, we've only been able to find a single case where it's ever been revoked along the lines of what the, the, the speaker or the questioner asked. Um, and it was a small sea cucumber fishery in Ecuador that adopted an ITQ in the early 2000s for one year and then changed management after that. But aside from that case, there are like five or six hundred others that have never done that as far as, as, far as we were able to find. Any other questions for Kate? And if you do have a question, um, if you could speak your name first prior to the question, that would be helpful. All right. Thank you, Kate. We'll, we'll move on to our next presenter, um, Peter Kuriyama from the University of Washington, whose presentation talks about incentivizing selectivity in the West Coast Crown Fish Fishery. Peter? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I think my research was kind of focused on two questions. Uh, the first question being, can fishermen control what they catch? Um, can they become more selective? And then the second question being, what are the costs associated with that selectivity? Um, and then to answer the first question, I think, yes, fishermen can control what they catch to a pretty significant extent. And that was shown in kind of looking at the utilization ratios, the catch to TAC ratios for things like canary um, and yellow eye rockfish. Um, and then sort of what are the costs of that? Um, the costs are that they're leaving a lot of fish in the water in the west coast. Um, and to get at that, we compared a very similar fishery um, that went under catch shares a little bit earlier in British Columbia, um, where the restrictions are much, much um, less. And they were able to catch a lot more of the allowable catch. Um, so kind of focusing on those two questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, were there any questions for Peter or comments? Peter, um, I have a question for you. Could, I wonder if you could just make a few other comments about what, how those two fisheries were different, the, the BC implementation of a multi-species ITQ and the West Coast ground fish uh, ITQ. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the main difference had to do with kind of these weak stock um, constraints. So, for example, in the BC fishery, there is no real analogy to yellow eye or canary. Um, you know, some stock that only allows 0.6 metric tons to be caught in a year. Um, there are some really low TACs in the British Columbia fishery, but um, I think largely it's there to protect the recreational sector that's targeting the same stock. Um, so an example I think is yellow eye, quillback, um, China and tiger rockfish, I think. I think that's the right complex. Um, so in BC, they have a one area has a really really low allowable catch, um, of, I think of like 0 0.5, 0 0.5 metric tons, and then in the recreational sector, the allowable catch is 49 metric tons. So it's really not operating in the same way that a yellow eye or a canary is on the west coast. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for? I'm not sure if I heard a question. Nope. Okay. okay. Um, so we'll move on to our next presentation, which is um, Jonna Wilson from the Nature Conservancy, um, who looked at fishermen profits in mixed stocked fisheries. John? Great. Thank you, Sarah. I think this work is a little bit different than some of the work that you're hearing as well. 
primarily because this is a conceptual framework for how to think about the costs and benefits of different types of fisheries management, primarily thinking about the costs of switching from trawl, non-selective gear, to selective gear, which typically tends to happen in ITQ fisheries. So that's what I'm going to be presenting here. What we do is we lay out a hypothesis for the relationship between aggregate profits and the costs of selective targeting of productive species. And it's important to clarify, which I generally mentioned, that selective targeting of certain species typically costs more than uh, non-selective targeting using gear such as trawls. And so we look at the costs and benefits of this selective targeting under four different types of management. The first is the traditional limited entry approach. Then we look at a, an approach where there's a limited entry system in which a spatial closure is placed on top of that limited entry approach. The third type of fishery management system that we explore is an IFQ quote, uh, approach, an individual fishing quota approach. And then the fourth, lastly, is an individual fishing quota approach with a spatial closure, an MPA placed on top of that. So in essence, what this work distills down to is a set of hypotheses that describe the circumstances under which profits in an ITQ are greater than profits in a limited entry system, as well as we also hypothesize the circumstances under which MPAs affect profits in each of those types of fisheries, the limited entry and the IFQ fisheries. We propose a set of hypotheses that I think I will conclude with here to drive this point home of what we looked at. We hypothesize that if an MPA does not improve profits in a limited entry system, then it will not improve profits in an IFQ system. Secondly, we suggest, we hypothesize that if an MPA does improve profits in a limited entry system, then it will also improve upon profits in an IFQ system, but only, and this is important, when the costs of targeting selective species, targeting uh, specific species, is high. Third, we hypothesize that if the cost of gear switching from non-selective to selective gear is zero, so if there's no cost of doing that, then an MPA will not improve upon profits in an IFQ system. And then lastly, if the cost of targeting of gear switching from non-selective to selective gear is low, then an IFQ alone, the system of IFQ as the, as the management system, accounts for the highest profits related to any of those other different types of fisheries management scenarios. And I will open the floor to questions. Thanks, Jono. Um, so any questions for Jono? I did. Well, thank you. Um, so next I'm going to um, hand it over to Steve Miller from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and um, Steve's prepared to answer questions both about his presentation and the video that was posted by um, Robert Deacon, who is not able to join us today. Um, and both of these presentations look at various dimensions of fishermen's responses to bycatch IFQs. Steve? Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so the research Bob and I have been working on is, is focused on how fishermen adapted their fishing practices to the introduction of ITQs, and specifically we're focused on ITQs uh, on bycatch species. And our motivation for studying this is pretty straightforward. Uh, ITQs can be seen to impose a cost for every pound of bycatch that a fisher catches, and if those costs are greater than the price that the fisher can get for that species at the dock, we expect that he's probably going to find ways to avoid catching those bycatch species. And so this is similar in nature to what Peter mentioned, but our focus is really on sort of how fishermen are actually achieving this. And so we try to document and test for evidence of several ways fishers adapted their fishing practices to avoid these quota costs for bycatch. And to do this, we made use of uh, quite a bit of trawl logbook data from the fishery, as well as a variety of price data for both the fish and some fishing inputs and some catch data for the fixed gear fishery as well. And just to jump to the results, we find evidence of four main types of adaptations that we document in the paper. Uh, spatial shifts, shorter toes, fishing more at night, and increased use of fixed gear. So none of these are particularly surprising, but our focus is really on trying to document and establish that this was actually a response to bycatch IFQs and not just the result of something else. Uh, 
And just to drill down on a couple of these, uh, we do find that fishers differentially avoid areas, uh, so they uh, change where they fish, and they avoid areas with higher bycatch incidence, and those areas also tend to be near to the RCA boundaries. And so you see this sort of fuzzing effect on the boundaries and some partial voluntary avoidance of the areas near there. And in addition, uh, we find fishers also fish more at night in areas with uh, more widow rockfish. And that's actually consistent with what uh, we heard from some fishers on an earlier webinar that we held, who said that they basically fish at night because they can fish cleaner because the widow rockfish actually vertically migrate off the seafloor and they can more cleanly target uh, the target species thereafter, which are typically some of the flatfish. So just in sum, uh, fishers seem to be finding several ways to avoid bycatch species, and we think this is at least in part due to the new IFQs on bycatch species. And some of these ways are pretty creative. And we hope that, uh, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, this can not only help us understand the effects of IFQs in this fishery, but also to kind of predict what some of the effects of IFQs in other fisheries might be as well. So that's all. So any questions or comments for Steve? Next presentation by Kataro Ono at the University of Washington, looking at how fish populations respond to fishing. Uh, hi, everybody. So my talk is not my topic is not directly related to the capture systems, but it basically it uses some data from the U.S. West Coast rockfish fishery. And so the main objective of this study was to try to examine the seasonal dynam dynamic of dorsal species and examine what kind of factors affect, is affecting the seasonal dynamics, namely maybe the fishing or also the movement of the species. And to do so, what we used is a three large-scale spatial uh, temporal data sets. One is the West Coast groundfish survey data, and the second one was the trawl logbook data collected on the U.S. West Coast, and the final data set was some habitat information on the U.S. West Coast, namely some temperature data or depth data and sediment size data. And all those data sets were used in combination with some novel uh, statistical model to try to make create a more accurate spatial distribution of the species along the West Coast. And by using those type of model, we, we were then able to examine the spatial uh, dy uh, seasonal dynamics of dorsal population along the coast. And it showed up that in the end, the population was mostly dominated by uh, the seasonal dynamics was mostly dominated by movement that occurred between a summer and fall time period, and the movement happened to send the fish more to offshore areas and to northern area along the Washington coast. And finally, the, uh, using this type of analysis, we were not able to detect too much the effect of fishing on the seasonal dynamics of Doversol. And that's it. Thank you very much. Katara, any questions or comments for Katara? All right, well then, Trevor, I'll hand it off to you. So Trevor Branch, also at the University of Washington, um, whose presentation talked about uh, catch shares and specifically expectations from other fisheries. Hi, I'm Trevor Branch at the University of Washington. Um, much of what I've done in the past is look at how catch shares change things before and after. Um, and so I want to just have a very general overview of what we expect to happen under catch shares. Um, the key reason catches are usually put in place is for economic reasons. So usually they improve prices. Um, you create a valuable asset, which is the quota share itself. Um, I know it's a privilege, but for many reasons, it's often treated as an asset. Um, so for economic reasons are usually why catch shares are put in place. Um, what I found looking at um, a past comparison of British Columbia versus the West Coast um, ground fish fishery was that some other things happened in British Columbia when they shifted over to catch shares, namely that um, discard rates went down so people threw less fish back overboard because of regulations than on the west coast before catch shares were put in place. And so one of the things we're looking at in, in, um, in Peter's project is to see whether you see the same thing on the west coast now that we have catch shares there as well. The other thing we expect to see is that your total allowable catch or your ABC or 
whatever the limit is to what you're allowed to catch, um, has a big influence before and afterwards. So before catches put in place in British Columbia, for example, lots of catches went well over the allowable quota for the whole fishery. And afterwards, almost all the, the fisheries, all the species catches were under the allowable catches. And so we expected to see something like that on the west coast. Um, we didn't quite see that, which, which is an interesting story in itself. The final thing that happens in catch shares is, of course, social change. And some of that can be good. There's more money to go around. Some of that can be bad. Some people leave the fishery that didn't want to leave the fishery. Sometimes quota moves from one place to another um, and can be disruptive. Um, very often there's concentration and some boats leave the fishery and that makes the remaining boats more profitable, but it makes the fishery a smaller fishery. And for those people who maintain boats for crew members and so on, there may be social disruption. So those are some of the, the broad things we expect to see from cat shares. Um, I'm happy to take any questions people have. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Any questions for Trevor? Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Professor, Professor Branch, I have a question. Um, Trevor, I wonder if you could, since you have this vast experience um, from looking at all these different systems, talk a little bit about the different ways that cash shares are designed. I mean, it's clearly, there clearly isn't just one form of cash share. There's all these different things you can do, have consolidation limits and have other kinds of restrictions on trading or ownership. And whether those things might be fine-tuned in a given fishery to try to minimize the negative kinds of impacts that you that you just raised. And and I guess maximize the positive impacts as well. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, very much so. Uh, there are lots of things you can do to tailor catch share programs. Um, I can't talk about all of them, but for example, in the Alaska halibut fishery, a very well-known example, they were concerned that lots of boats might leave and it would be a, a fishery concentrated in, in the hands of a few people. And so they put owner on board restrictions and limits on how much quota any one entity can own, which were quite small. Um, it hasn't quite worked perfectly there, but there certainly is a much bigger fleet fishing halibut in Alaska now than they would be without those limits. Um, and the owner on board restriction means somebody has to, somebody owns the quota has to actually be on board fishing. You can't just sit on sit on shore and let somebody else do the fishing for you and rake in all the money. Um, it's not a perfect system, but that's the kind of thing that can be done to to restrict change. It, there's always a balance between the more restrictions or regulations you put in on how much quota you can trade or how much quota you can own, the less profitable the fishery is going to be overall. Um, so it's always a balancing act. Um, so that's that's one example of something people have done before. Over and out. Great. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Trevor? And you know, at this point, I'd also like to just open it up to any more general questions about um, this research project. We've got lots of time, so. Um, we're open to both questions or comments or observations that um, any of the participants have made about this fishery. Um, just to get us kicked off, I wanted to raise a question for all of the presenters. And one thing I was wondering about is if you were um, looking to another sort of similar mixed stock fishery that was considering a transition to an ITQ system, what do you think are the real lessons um, to be learned based on the research you've done so far on this fishery? So. What are the things that seem to have worked really well, and what might be the things you would suggest to do differently? I sort of open up that question to all of the researchers that are on the line today. I'll just kick it off. I mean, it seems like one of the really key things is that you, when they made the switch in this fishery to the ITQ, they allowed gear switching. And I, my understanding is prior to the ITQ, <coughs> gear switching was illegal. You, could, you couldn't switch from your trawl to a hook and line, for example. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons 
they've been able to, you know, tackle the weak stock problem in this fishery with the ITQ is because of the gear switching provision. So I would say that's one lesson is if gear switching isn't allowed, it ought to be it ought to be allowed to allow for those kinds of opportunities. Great, thanks, Chris. I think one of the things we're also learning that we definitely need to do more work on and some of the work coming out of the Nature Conservancy and some of the research that I've conducted is showing that it's really important to keep observer costs down, that there's a, a threshold at which if observer costs are too high or if the costs in general of switching to selective gear are too high, then it's going to be, there are going to be negative impacts on the fishery. So it's important to quantify where that threshold is and try to understand how to reduce costs in that fishery from selective targeting as well as observers. Mm -hmm. This is Trevor here. Just uh, one thing that that struck me about the, the development of this cat share program was how long it took to go through all of the the, the hoops that, that it takes to get new regulations passed in the U.S. Um, in in the British Columbia fishery, my understanding is maybe it's somewhat apocryphal. They locked all they locked everybody in a room and said, "Come up with a plan for how the quota is going to be divided up." And it took them an afternoon, um, and the and the, the, the catch up issue was implemented in about a year, and here on the west coast it took about seven years, and some people will say fifteen years depending on when you start counting. So just that these these programs don't come about quickly. There are lots of discussions and um, lots of boxes to tick, lots of checks and balances to to make sure that people aren't being harmed. Um, lots of environmental impact statements and so on, um, but it does mean that everybody's voice gets heard, I think, uh, in the U.S. system. We've got a question in the chat box. We've got a question in the chat box from Frank Lockhart. Were there any surprises that you believe warrant further research? Well, Trevor, you mentioned a surprise earlier. Maybe you could address that. Yeah, one of the biggest surprises for me, this is Trevor again, Trevor Branch. Um, one of the biggest surprises for me was uh, just how little of the allowable catch has been caught for many, many species in, in the West Coast. Um, and I, I could understand if the uh, uh, overfished species were, had their quota caught and then everybody stopped fishing for everything else. But in, in most cases, it's not the overfished species that are reaching their limits and shutting down the rest of the fishery. It's, it's catches of sable fish and other target species. So it's a puzzle to me why um, the allowable catches aren't, aren't reached in this fishery, uh, and in fact, far from being reached in this fishery. And I'd really appreciate any um, insights from those involved uh, more heavily in the fishery than I am as to why that, that has occurred. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so this is Frank. I, I, I put the chat box, but I, I think part of it is at least um, that markets don't turn or, turn on a dime, and uh, this fishery uh, survived, you know, for a decade or more on very much reduced harvests of you know all these rockfish stocks and. Um, Therefore, their markets, their, their customers, uh, went away, and here it, they, they, you don't want to catch something that's either going to be ground up into fish food or fertilizer, um, uh, and not make you know. I I think that's a lot of what's going on there, um, but it's not. It's uh, you know we have some data that we're out here pretty soon that. Um, there, there have been some increases. They're modest, but there have been some increases in attainment. Of, but um, yeah, I guess that, that's my thought. This is the, yeah, the, the, the one overlay. This is Shem Judd with Environmental Defense. I think I agree with Frank that a lot of it is market constraints. I think another piece here too is that in some ways we have kind of two regulatory systems still over. Um, over each other, right? A lot of the pre-IFQ regulations remain in effect, and we have the IFQ regulations, and so we haven't seen some of the efficiencies and flexibility. 
really come online that I think we would have anticipated. I think a good example is the yellowtail rockfish fishery. Uh, right now you can only fish yellowtail rockfish once the whiting season starts in mid-June. It's a huge CAC, they're catching about 20%, and part of the reason is the season's six months long instead of 12. So I think that's I think that's another important piece there too, Trevor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Management team for about seven years now, and or I've just ended my time with the, the graphics management team. But uh, I would say the the answer to Trevor's question about about sablefish in particular is that in surprise it was a surprise to me that you know we focus a lot on over fish species as being concerning, but sablefish actually I think if some of our uh, my other colleagues were here it actually turns out to be constraining. Uh, on the harvest of other species, so they run out of sablefish, or they run out of, of, of canary rockfish, yellow eye rockfish. So it's uh, you know, it's, it's there's so many species, it's very complicated. But yeah, so they, my my thought would be that they've actually run out of sablefish before. You know, that's that's what what keeps them from, from obtaining uh, harvest of the other species. Yeah, that's right. This is Seth Atkinson from NRDC here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, do, I think I agree with all the previous speakers there. Frank on the markets question and Shem's on, you know, there being some pre-existing regulations that haven't been removed and um, Corey on the really complex interplay between um, species and sort of what becomes constraining at what points. I think the other thing that I just note fundamentally is that the catch limits are um, biologically determined numbers. You know, these are numbers that come out of a stock assessment. They're produced, I mean, they're, they're, they depend on biological factors, you know, productivity, biomass, stuff like that, and they have absolutely no bearing on how much has ever been caught and how much, you know, people want to eat the things. Like Dover Sole has an incredibly high, um, whatever it is, ABC, OFL, ACL, and the fact is, you can't sell that stuff um, to people a lot of the time because people just don't want to eat it. So it's like these are, I think it's a little bit of a, a false problem statement or a false premise to say, okay, we have good biological information on a number of these stocks and we could potentially kill this many fish, but uh, we're not doing so and therefore that's a problem. It's more like, I, I think the better analogy would be to say sort of at a time when these stocks were all regarded as healthy, how much were we catching at that point versus how much are we catching now? Something like that. So I, I guess I would encourage you to look at sort of a longer time series of landings and, and question whether just having an ABC or an ACL, like the availability to catch it actually means people want to or you know what's driving behavior there, that's all. Yeah, this is Corey from Washington again. I would, uh, yeah, to, to re maybe state my point and Seth and and, and Shams and, and Frank said it's just really it's not just the overfish species that constrain things. It's it's market demand and it's it is the uh, overfishing limits of of the target species like sable fish as well that that do end up driving driving what we see in terms of uh, harvest and payment rates. These were all really useful comments. Um, back to Frank's original question, do any of the other researchers have sort of surprises that they've encountered that they'd be interested in pursuing with future research or think would be a good future research project? Um, this is Peter here. Oh, go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Um, yeah, one of the things that um, I've been kind of thinking about is that so a lot of the benefits of cat shares have to do with the transferability of cat shares and the transferability I think comes down to kind of what is the value of certain types of quota um, and how people develop a sense for what it's worth 
And from talking to people involved in the fishery on the West Coast, and um, I get the sense that a lot of the quota exchanges are based on trades. And I think Dan Holland had a paper that came out in BC that found um, essentially there is no real market, there's no efficient market for quota. It's all happening on kind of a barter basis. Um, and so I've kind of been thinking about what would determine the value of quota if there is any, or if people on the West Coast are just trading it in these bundles. And obviously the risk pool kind of makes um, the value of quota a moot point because there's not really any need to transfer quota too much. Um, so those are kind of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, and I'm not sure if there is a way to get at that. Um, so anyway, thanks. I wonder if Steve Miller would like to respond to that, because one of the things I know that Steve and Bob Deacon did in the research project that Steve mentioned earlier is, uh, Peter, is that they, they were, so what they did is they looked at this very detailed data set of where fishermen fish and what they caught there and were able to back out kind of an implicit price. So how, how hard were they trying to avoid species X versus species Y. And in a, in a way that sort of starts to get, it, I think, an answer to your question. So even if there's no, there's no actual price, they might try to avoid these because of constraints that they may hit, either because it's hard to barter that species or for some other reason. So I don't know. Steve, did yeah. you have any comments? No, I think that's a, a pretty good summary. Just to quickly recap what Chris said, our approach in our paper as part of estimating that model of uh, where fishers choose to fish. Uh, we basically try to back out what the quota prices were that fishermen would be willing to pay, even if we don't observe them on a market or we only observe a small number of trades. You would kind of say, uh, if a fisher was willing to go a little bit farther from port and use a little bit extra fuel, maybe um, use a little bit extra ice and things like that in order to, to sort of trade off the bundle of species that he's going to end up catching in his net, you can start to back out uh, how much he's willing to pay. So I think that may provide a a useful uh, maybe a way of getting at that problem. You can look at some of the other constraints as well that fishers might be facing um, and you can start to put a price that's just based on behavior and not based on actual market data. Cool, thanks Steve and Chris. Um, I was wondering if you remember what in, what in general I guess the, the cost of yellow eye avoidance was um, because I'm talking to some people who are kind of on the, the um, management side of it and they say that fishermen are completely unwilling to trade any yellow eye quota at any point until essentially the end of the year, right before Christmas. Um, and so trying to think about like the market value of something like that, I mean, would it have to be the total value of their potential catch in a year? And like, I don't think they would be willing to trade it really. But anyway, I was wondering if you had any comments on yellow eye specifically, if you remember. Yeah. I'd have to look back at the exact numbers, but from what I remember, it depended a little bit on what assumptions uh, you're willing to make about uh, some of the different uh, fuel burn rates and things like that. But it, I think in the low end, we estimated something around $10 a pound, um, and on the high end, uh, it was up to about 50 but I, I have a little bit more faith in the $10 number. And the few trades we did observe uh, through Jefferson State were, I think, on the order of uh, 20 to $30 a pound up front. I think it's declined since then. Um, but it's it's not an entire year's revenues or anything like that. And so there may be quite a hefty risk premium um, based on what you mentioned about fishers only being willing to trade late in the season. Uh, that could be a big part of it as well. I have a, are we, can we okay. move on? Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question um, or, you know, an area of research that I think is has been stimulated by this work and it really has to do with the role that the Nature Conservancy has played in this fishery, uh, you know, we sort of take it for granted because we all live here and we've grown accustomed to TNC being involved in Morro Bay and elsewhere, but it's pretty unique and if you look around the world at other weak stock uh, type fisheries, you don't, you don't see that. You don't see engagement by NGOs that, that are not just trying to shut the fishery down, but in fact the opposite, trying to work with the fishery to make it more productive, more profitable, and, you know, have a longer, brighter future. At least that's my, my perception of TNC's involvement. So 
I think that raises questions about, I mean, fully admitting that there are lessons learned, and I'm sure TNC would admit there are things they would do differently if they could do it all over again. But those caveats aside, I, I think it raises questions about whether that is a model for, you know, cooperative formation or risk pool formation in other fisheries like the West Coast groundfish fishery that have these, you know, these risky, this, this chance of a risky toe because of the weak stock problem. So I'd be very interested to hear thoughts, particularly from fishermen, if, if you know, if they're willing to say about how they view TNC's role and whether they think something like that could work in other fisheries. Or, of course, comments from any, anybody else who has something to say on that. Okay, I think I have, this is Peter again. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, just to follow up, I think it sets a good example um, because, I don't know, it kind of raises the question of who's going to bear the cost of management in the future. Um, a lot of people are turning to ecosystem-based management, fishery management, and that kind of requires, you know, maybe more studies, maybe more data collection. Um, and given that, I don't know, federal budgets seem locked in and not likely to increase significantly in the future, um, I think either the, the industry is going to have to cover some of the costs of data collection and management, or maybe NGOs can set kind of the model for that um, around the country and also worldwide. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is from Washington again. I mean, from the last couple of comments, I the market has ever been given. The market has given the chance to work. And I, I started a couple of years before this, few years before this program went into place. And even then, and, and people were in close contact with British Columbia folks, and the British Columbia folks were were, were uh, definitely influential in, in getting people support for this program, but. It was always it was always going to be the thought was it the market is not going to work, and it's and yellow eye is, is is the extreme example. It's a, it's very very rarely caught in troll, but um, everyone is worried about that, and that's and, and it's this it might be a case of this is where you know, irrationality shows that you know, rational markets they don't work, and this is nothing risk pool is nothing more than insurance really. And it's happening everywhere, you know, in, in other sectors. But this, you know, when you, when you, I think Steve, Steve Miller's presentation had it was like fifty dollars a pound for yellow wire, and one assumption ten dollars for the other, which is is really really low compared to how people are actually you know, presumably reacting towards the risk of, of yellow eye. So um, it's just maybe it's, it's a good example of people's perceptions versus. Um, Fears of reality, but in, in watching his presentation, and kind of wondering if, how much he could, uh, if, could if, if we cut the yellow eye by, you know, it's now like one metric ton for the whole IFQ sector. What if we double it to two metric tons? You guys think your techniques could differentiate what what the effect might be on the fishery? Is that something that's possibly? So uh, this is Steve. Uh, just to make sure I understood your question, Corey, were you asking if we could essentially use the model that we built to try to predict what would happen if there were an alternate uh, limit set on yellow eye if it, if it was doubled, for example? Correct. Yeah, I mean, we could. Uh, if you believe that the, the model we have is really an accurate reflection of Fisher behavior, then uh, we could certainly look at an alternate price um, on uh, on that particular species that might result from it, um, and you could start to look at uh, 
where you think fishers might reallocate effort. Um, as is, I don't think the model would really give us everything we need. Um, it is purely based on just uh, looking at fishers' behaviors and backing out prices. There's nowhere really for us to explicitly put a quota into the model. Um, so we'd have to start to try to, uh, I think, model the determination of the price based on the quota in the first place. And then we'd also have to have uh, more of a dynamic biological model as well to try to look at some longer term consequences. Uh, because right now it's purely just trying to look at how fishermen are reacting in a particular year. Uh, and it's not really an inherently biological model at all. So I think with extension, we could start to get at that question, but um, we have some of the basic pieces in place already. Yeah, cool. Because what I'm, because what I was, what else would I say is fifty, fifty dollars a pound, if that, and that was your upper uh, estimate if, in a yellow eyes about, I'm um, like two or three, maybe four kilograms. So that's like what, twenty. Can't do metric to pounds in my head, but you know that's like twenty. So it's like a, a few hundred bucks at most. Compared and to me, it seems very well. We're having a huge debate at the at the Pacific Council now about a monitoring cost of observers and. Compared to observing cost, the cost of catching a yellow eye, like maybe once, you know, once a year, once every five years, it's it's one of those type of events. That it's, so people seem to be overreacting to it. Is what I'm is what I'm getting at. And um, so yeah, I'm just kind of curious of what. And Dan Holland did some. Um, I forget what he called it, the, the tail conditional expectation type, uh, financial risk type analysis with yellow eye. So. Um, one of the, yeah, because one of the big questions we have in rebuilding is what is what is the cost, um, if the trade-off between the time to rebuild and, and the effect it has on the fishing communities, and so this so this type of analysis you guys are trying is getting rid right of that. I'm just kind of wondering how much it can help, and we don't have a very um, we don't have much ability to to tell the difference between a metric ton of yellow eye to IF, the trawl sector or two right now. So. These methods you guys are looking at, you all are looking at, would be potentially a way of getting better at doing that analysis. Yeah, and I think uh, that's those are excellent points. Um, I do think that there is a, a risk component that's at play here, um, as we heard about the differences in the trading volume throughout the year. It may well be that there's a risk risk premium that declines throughout the course of the year. Um, the prices we do see are somewhat consistent with the trades that we actually do observe, and again, it's a very small number of trades. But I think a, a more sophisticated model that more properly treats risk, and maybe we can talk to Dan and see if we can integrate some of his techniques, uh, might get us closer to that. But right now, I wouldn't want to make any sort of uh, policy predictions about what would happen if you actually changed the, the catch limit for yellow eye. I don't think our model is, is quite there yet. Um, but I do think with some extensions, we could start to get at questions like that. Can I just chime in about the 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 issue about yellow eye and and how it's some of the other species that are that are running into the quota are surprising? Um, so I think that what we need to be looking at is not just how weak the stocks are in terms of how small their projected quota is, but how weak they are relative to one another, and particularly with respect to how inflexible the catch mixes are in the different uh, fishing opportunities. So, for example, I'm uh, the luxury of sitting in my my computer right now. I'm I'm just uh, running some of the numbers of of comparing the catch rates to the growth rates um, in the different uh, fisheries. And one of the things that that jumps out at me that's very consistent with what you guys are saying is that sablefish and uh, and long spine thorny head are a lot weaker relative to Dover sole. And those are the three biggest catches in the the, the bottom trawl. And that might explain, for example, why you're you're not running uh, anywhere close to your quota on on sole. It sounds like, but you're you're hitting your quota on things like sablefish before, say, things like rockfish, because maybe uh, the 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 issue is is w with the weak stock problem is less about having uh, species that are really really slow growing like the rockfish, and more just having these mixes that are hard to disentangle, where you have one species that's very much weaker than another. But maybe in the scale of the whole uh, complex, not necessarily the weakest or the strongest. Can you hear me? Okay, we've got a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've got a question in the chat box. 
Uh, the question was from Santee Roberts, could you talk a little bit more re-gear switching? For example, why do some <coughs> ITQ programs disallow gear switching? Which conservation benefits are not as great when there's no gear switching allowed? What about outside of ITQ programs, i.e. just in LE programs? So I, I can start on that, and I'm sure others have thoughts on this as well. <clears throat> My understanding um, is that, and maybe this is naive, but is that the programs that disallow gear switching, that that's really just an artifact of history where when in a race to fish, you know, in a limited entry system where the only thing, the only way the manager can, can regulate the catch is by shortening the fishing season, um, that creates an incentive for everybody to go out and fish as fast as they can and the way to fish as fast as you can is to use a bottom trawl. Um, and so really nobody had a particular interest in gear switching because if you switched to something more selective it would cost a lot more money and take a lot more time to be selective and in that, fi in that fishery management system you would never survive. And so it only becomes possible to survive in that setting when you switch to something where you know the season lengthens out and you have a guaranteed share of the catch. That's my view on the matter, but I, I maybe there are other perspectives as well. And so it really it's sort of a recent phenomenon for and, and the other point is that it's only really a relevant issue if, uh, with mixed stock fisheries. If you have a single stock fishery and you switch to an ITQ, there's no particular reason you would want to switch gears from a fisherman's perspective, although there might be ecosystem benefits, for example, from reduced um, destruction of bottom habitat. Although that's not always the case either. Sometimes bottom trawls are relatively benign in some habitats. So anyway, I, I think the point is that uh, gear switching becomes particularly relevant in multi-species fisheries that are switching to an ITQ, like the one we have here. So I think that's why we don't hear so much about this issue but as uh, multi-species ITQs become more and more popular um, for a variety of reasons, I think we're likely to see more discussion about gear switching. This is Trevor Branch here. I think this is an, an interesting question. Um, it's slightly broader than just switching gear, but um, one effect that catch share fisheries do have is, is they make it more expensive for people to enter that particular fishery um, because you have to buy a quota to get in and that makes it much harder to have quota ownership of multiple fisheries and so one consequence of catch shares can be that you might have somebody who's part of the year fishes shrimp, part of the year fishes crab, part of the year fishes ground fish, part of the year fishes halibut and if all of them go to catch share fisheries and, the, and that person has to buy quota for each of those four separate fisheries, they may not be able to afford to enter all those fisheries. Um, so you might end up with much more specialization. Um, and that's fine provided all the stocks are in good shape, but it's a, it's, it's a much more risky scenario if one of the fisheries does badly, then you're stuck with the fishery you bought into um, and much more expensive to go and change to another fishery. So some of these um, bigger effects touch on gear switching but also on, on fishery switching as well and how best can you minimize your overall risk of fishing by having a portfolio of fisheries you can enter versus specializing in one fishery and making a lot of money from that particular fishery. Yeah, this is Corey from Washington again and um, a, a couple of thoughts of uh, you know, again, being de being here during the development of our our Pacific Coast program, and one, you know, I've, it's not all about it's not about conservation necessarily. It's about you know economic efficiency is what IFQs are are best at, and the count the Pacific Council made a ha had a debate of whether to have uh, three sectors like or or four sectors. I might be getting numbers wrong, but it was really about you know when you can consider the the whiting sectors. And so uh, they considered to have um, the shoreside whiting sector be part of the bottom trawl 
IFQ sector, combine those two instead of having them separate. And then, then keeping the mothership whiting sector in, in the, at the catcher process sector separate. And so it was probably just about as much as, as fairness and equity investment as anything else. And then maybe some thoughts about when they decided to combine the whiting sector with bottom trawl sector, it was maybe about having with the whiting, which is very valuable, and in the non-whiting, which is you know of sable fish and Dover sole, the trolley sole, some of the thorny heads are where ninety percent of the money comes from. You know, that, that's that's where it was. It was you know, that was what the consideration was. But with the gear switching uh, and, and efficiency and all that, it's it's really to me it's become it's a really interesting example of you know how of, of those considerations of fairness and equity in, in community social considerations versus economic because um, when, you, when you gear switch on the west coast what it really means is is your is when you go from trawl bottom trawl to fixed gear it means you're it means you're gonna get you target sable fish and so what we've heard from from the industry from the public is that if you let the gear switching has let sable fish fishermen buy a trawl permit, which was a you know barrier to entry that to get into the IFQ fishery, that they, you know, to get after the sable fish. Well, then you need sable fish to get the not just long spine thorny heads, but the short spine thorny heads. I think are more valuable, and so you need all the you need you need all those species to get the Dover sole and thorny head. You need sable fish to get Dover sole and thorny head, and so the trawling community was bottom trawl community was coming on saying, well, you're gonna perhaps put us you know, at, at risk here by if you if you let the sable fish go to the to the long line in, in you know pot or trap fisheries, then you're gonna you, you might reduce our ability to get Dover sole and thorny head. So again, maybe just a comment how more complicated that that reality is in a, on this coast and maybe in many coasts in multi-species fisheries than than models really are. But so that's the debate we've heard is. And I think in the first year of the program, 45 or 50 percent around that went for, of the sable fish IFQ quota, which was traditionally caught by the trawl fleet, was caught by hook and line gear. And I think it's back down a bit from that. But um, so that's the real issue we've been we've been dealing with in the policy arena. Any other questions or comments on other topics? I have a question. Go ahead, Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Nichols from Santa Barbara. I'm interested in asking the group about um, perceptions of change after IFQ implementation. So um, be that ecological or social changes after implementation, and maybe if anyone has thoughts about timelines too, I'd be interested to in see what the varying perspectives are on that. Maybe if we have any fishers on the phone too. Hey Katie, this is Peter. Um, and I, I think one of the coolest things about the West Coast um, groundfish is the formation of the risk pools and kind of what kind of changes are those bringing on. Um, and Ian Taylor, who I think is online right now from the Northwest Fishery Science Center, um, kind of asked me a question about considering the risk pool as a success. Um, kind of what are the metrics that you would use to determine that the risk pool is a success? Um, you know, maybe that's socially, economically, or biologically. Um, and I think I looked at the the cash to TAC numbers. So that's kind of on a more fishery-based metric. Um, and I, I'd say that the results are encouraging, but um, maybe it's not. It's a little too smooth things about it. Um, but maybe if Kate Labor to talk a little bit. Um, but maybe if Kate. Labrum has any comments on kind of profits in the risk pool 
um, in the past couple of years and just general um, perception that fishermen have about, about that. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So um, I think if you were to ask one of the fishermen in the risk pool uh, what they perceived as uh, success in the risk pool, they would basically say it's what keeps them fishing. Uh, it is an insurance policy. It provides that backup uh, in case there is an event that's not predicted and hasn't been um, avoided out there catching over fish species. The byproducts of having this collaborative um, fishing arrangement have been sort of the surprise. Uh, in addition to just having the insurance uh, policy of the quota there, these associations, there's three associations in the California Risk Pool, have gotten together and they're sharing other types of information across the ports and across even boats within the same port that never would have done so before. They're also finding efficiencies um, elsewhere in, in, in the policy realm and actually um, coming together to put together things like an application for an exempted fishing permit to test out electronic monitoring this fishery and, and determine if there's ways to reduce costs out there. Uh, we have been keeping track of the fishermen's um, catch, uh, their total catch, their total target catch, their total um, overfish species catch, and we, instead of using individual profit data, um, which can be actually very difficult to track uh, amongst a large group, um, we're using just regular ex vessel value um, averages from, from the fleet. And with those numbers, the, the most important result, I think, is that when you look across the, the non-whiting fleet, so those, those fishermen in the West Coast ground fish fishery that are out there not targeting whiting, um, you see the risk pool catching a greater percentage of the target species in their area, which is basically south of the 4010 line, um, it, all in California. So things like uh, yellowtail rockfish are not a target species down there. Things like um, uh, arrowtooth flounder are a little bit less common as well. Um, and sablefish south is a main target species. And in that region, the risk pool is actually uh, catching its target species at a higher rate when you compare it to the rest of the fleet. Um, and they consider that to be uh, the success of having the ability to share information with each other, uh, to use eCatch and then have the insurance policy and be able to go and explore areas that they may not have fished before and don't fully understand the risk uh, of, of the overfish species catch in that area and know that they have the ability to go in, test it. If it's uh, within the thresholds that the risk pool is set and abides by, then they can continue fishing in that place and potentially catch species that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. So I don't have any hard numbers on um, increased profits, but I think if you were to ask any of the fishermen, they could tell you uh, some of the benefits that they realize while being in the risk pool and what they really would think success is. Thanks, Kate. Those are great comments. Any other questions or comments from, the, from anyone on the line? I know it's getting towards dinner time, so we're <laughs> we're happy to wrap it up. If but we want to make sure that we've covered all the questions and comments that people might have. Wrap. <clears throat> yeah. Great. Let me just conclude by thanking everybody for your participation. We really appreciate you sticking sticking around and asking great questions and providing good comments. Um, I think on your screen you ought to see our website, and so we'd love to hear from you if you have, you know, concerns, questions, ideas for collaborations, ideas for future research, even just questions about about the research. We'd love to hear from you. So feel free to be in touch, and uh, thank you very much for participating. Yeah, thank you. We will also be posting a recording of this online, so the link. Um, will be is there and it'll be up on our sustainable fisheries group website so other folks maybe that you've heard wanted to join and couldn't uh, will be able to listen in later yeah and we'll leave up all of the um, video presentations so that uh, if you haven't checked out some of those you still have the opportunity to do so <laughs>
Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks, everyone.